Patty. Well, hi, welcome everybody to another great segment in our Women Lead online forums that are brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. And today we bring you Sean Marie Turry and Truth is the New Black, a thought-provoking fireside style virtual conversation series. It's real talk about business and life and career, about desire and disappointment, about truth and what it takes to create a life and a work that you love. Sean Marie is a multi-passionate, multi-talented business strategist who helps businesses get things done and leaders lead better. And she is an irrepressible seeker of the truth. As a master desire map facilitator, she's taken hundreds through her programs. And she is my partner in crime here in the Women Lead Online Forum series. So Sean Marie, tell us what you have for us today. Can't wait. Mm, thank you so much, Patty. And welcome everyone, whether you are listening live or tuning into the recording that you're here. And thank you so much. Uh, tonight, I have the absolute pleasure of bringing a very special guest to you. Her name is Kim Lowe. Uh, Kim is an author and a conflict resolution and negotiation expert, and she is a leadership coach. And she is the co-author of a brand new baby that she just birthed. It came out yesterday. Uh, congratulations again, Kim. Uh, the, the, name of, the name of the book that she co-authored is Compassionate Conversations, and I would like to welcome our very special guest, Kim Lowe, to Truth is the New Black. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean Marie. Thank you, Patty, for having me, and thank you to those of you who are listening to this conversation. Mm. I just get into I'm, it. Kim, I'm so happy that you're here, and with everything that you have going on, the launch of your new book, I know that you are incredibly busy, and I'm just immensely grateful that you made some time for this conversation today, and I think it could be more perfect. And our topic for today is compassion, resilience, and the power of change. And, uh, and Kim and I had been talking about having this conversation uh, before COVID hit, before um, the social uprising and this incredibly powerful movement that we are all seeing on the planet at the moment. And so I just, I, I think that the, this is really divine timing. And uh, Kim, one of the, the things that I really wanted to ask you, especially there's, there's so much division that we are experiencing right now, and um, it really feels like there are sides being chosen, and uh, the, way that our, the way that our news is being delivered, and you know, just this, this internal conflict that many people are feeling, the external conflict, that you are experiencing, uh, you know, wear or don't wear a mask, you know, uh, are you Republican, are you Democrat, are you for Black Lives Matter, are you against Black Lives, like it's so, it feels very high stakes right now. And so one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was specifically regards to compassion, because so many people see compassion as the softer approach, the sweeter approach. Um, it's a little too tender for some people. They think compassion is, is more of an esoteric conversation. So would you please kick things off by sharing with us what does compassion mean to you and how do you use compassion to move through the world and do the work that you do? Yeah, thank you for that. That's such a great question and starting point for us. Um, completely agree with what you said about the divisive polarizing times we're in because of the nature of my work and just how I've been orienting towards this kind of issue for the you know these years in my work I've come to really think about conflict as an opportunity for us to grow to become more creative more resourced and often able to take different perspectives than we might have originally entered into the conflict in I think also that when we are stressed and we are on high alert and conditions are, are shaking a little bit, we human beings sometimes might have a tendency to regress, to go to more towards a safe ground, choosing the option that's here and makes sense rather than you know, having the creative mind ask what else is possible. So conflict really stretches us in that way. 
And I believe I take somewhat of an, and my co-authors take somewhat of an evolutionary approach to the nature of consciousness and what it is we're seeking to do here as human beings. So we think about compassion too, as this kind of um, like, like Russian dolls nested within, but there are layers upon layers and upon layers. And I would say now, maybe because of where I'm at and where I, how I'm relating to the world, I view compassion as the fluidity and freedom with which we can take up other perspectives and be willing to shift from where we have been habitually residing to take the time to go and ask, what is it like for you? How can I listen to you and connect him with your reality? And that doesn't mean that is soft and then listening means agreement and now we have to go wherever you're saying, but it does mean I dignify you as a human being fundamentally. Um, Mm. Maybe the final thing that I just want to add to that is um, in, in Buddhism, we talk about um, compassion and there's a story about like idiot compassion or foolish compassion, which is the kind where you're just maybe you're, you're turning the other cheek, except the thing is you keep on doing it and you're not seeing the own habit that you're falling into, which is cutting yourself short from a greater possibility. And instead of doing that sort of foolish compassion that could lead to codependent ruts, Instead, we're bringing fierceness, we're bringing aliveness. And sometimes it might be a penetrating energy, a disruptive quality that's present in our compassion that's actually seeking to find the greater truth. And I love the name of the, the podcast and where you orient to around this, around truth, because I do see the relationship between compassion and truth as something that's been very inspiring for my, for my work. So mm. thank you for that. Oh, Kim, thank you. No, it's really... You know, and maybe a little further in the podcast um, or in the conversation when, when we open it up, I, I think that there is, um, I think that there's a real power in having the discussion around conflict and, um, you know, the shadow work or the dark side or, um, you know, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm in a class right now and we are, uh, we're basically studying the schools of mystery and, uh, and in many different forms, we're talking about Carl Jung. And, and one of the things that I think is interesting about what you said is that in the Arcana and in Tarot, um, the, the first card is the zero, which is the fool. Um, but yet the artwork that um, many artists have used to uh, describe this, uh, this particular archetype um, is often a child or, or someone taking a leap off a cliff, um, taking that leap into the abyss and, and moving into the unknown. And so it's so interesting the way that there's this study and this conversation around, you know, foolishness, like, like the connotation that comes with that is that it's a, you know, it's a fool's errand or it's a mistake. But, but I think in so many ways, it's a leap of faith, right? That, that it is the stepping off into the abyss, knowing um, that there will be something there to provide safety and to catch us. And I, I feel a lot of ways like moving into these conversations um, around compassion and meeting somebody in the middle. Uh, it is a leap of faith, but I think like you were saying, like if we can, if we can bring to those conversations as much as humanly possible, the resistance to bring an agenda and to really be there to have a better understanding and to start to bridge that gap um, and to enter it into a compassionate negotiation, I think is, uh, is a, an incredibly important and powerful thing. So Again, I'm so grateful for your work in the world, Kim, because we, we really need it right now. Um, and something else I, I wanted to ask you, which I think is, which is often uh, not spoken about in a sense of uh, how vital it is, um, but how overwhelming not only this work can be, but how overwhelmed I think the majority of people are right now, whether it is with everything that is going on in the world, with COVID, with uh, protecting themselves, protecting their families, just the, the simple act of being at home, right? Like, at, like the majority of people are at home with their family. Like they're probably spending more time with their family now than they ever have. So one of the things that I thought we could talk about is 
you know, in dealing with the overwhelm that we are experiencing right now, um, how do we discern what our work is versus when we need to actually rest? You know, when we are out there advocating and being activists and marching and protesting, and we just need to come home and make a spaghetti dinner for our family or take a nap. Um, and if you could maybe speak to what can often happen in the middle of that, uh, which I know for myself has been to really work on resisting judging myself for not being out there and doing more, um, for needing to rest. Uh, and also, you know, just, I think where a lot of us are with our businesses, like, like there's this, we're kind of in a, a bit of a pressure cooker. So, um, if you could speak to what our work really is and, and when we need to rest and, and how we find the, the balance in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think even more so in these times, the, the destabilization to the regular routines and rhythms can lead to a lot of self-scrutiny of like, so what now and what is the right thing to do? I also would just add at the outset that we're existing in a time where our level of social commentary and the level of sort of, you know, global engagement through the internet and through the shared conversations that we're having, we have a, a commentary on our ways of making change like never before. And as with, is the case with just societies and sometimes having mainstream discourses, many of us, I think, are still vulnerable to certain kinds of messages about what it is to be a good ex social justice warrior, mother, mm. business owner, um, from, you know, compassionate conversation, author, what, you know, what is the right one that I should be in that. So I noticed that self-judgment, as you mentioned there, can sometimes be adding a lot of more of the energetic um, drain than needs be the case. And so I think it's really our responsibility to look at how we are interpreting information we're receiving from, this, from society and then metabolizing it so that we can best choose for ourselves. Um, I think it is absolutely vital to, well, let me just take a step back actually from that. Um, one thing that I think might be worth saying sort of for this conversation is that I've recently been um, articulating to myself how much nature is my teacher. Mm. And so maybe, yeah, that's something that I imagined would come up today because it's just, it's feeling alive in me. And one of the, the lessons that I'm attuning to now, which I feel is relevant to your question, is about cycles and seasons. And there are moments to rise up. There's moments when the soil is fertile. You know, there's dampness in the air and life can come forth and we will feel that because we will be alive in our systems. Our verticality will let us know. Our heart, mind, hands, alignment will let us know that that is the moment for us to activate and be inspired and be spontaneous. And then there will be moments for that to die down. The fire can't burn in the same way. There also comes to a gentle, a gentle simmering and then we you know, we, what have we learned from our activity? What do we take inwards? I think many of us right now, jumping ahead, are in a period where we're actually seeking to integrate and even just rework some of the coherent narratives which we human beings actually somewhat need for ourselves, you know, to coherently meaning make so that what we're doing, what we're waking up for in the morning, the ways in which we're tending to these people around us, this, you know, we're sense-making machines. It's got to make sense to us. And, and it is taxing to have that jolted by our reality, you know? And so in that moment, for me, it's like for some people, there is breakthrough. Now we have a moment where our, say, our social, our racial sort of conversation has become heightened. So those people who are poised and able to make, you know, worthwhile contributions and bring forth their hearts and their bodies and stand up for what they believe in, this is, this is their moment to do so, and that's wonderful, and we have to celebrate that opportunity and push forward, and at the same time, notice where we're applying that self-judgment again about what it is to be good. Some of our most dignified work can be that which we are doing with our children, in our homes, with the people who mm. are working in the stores down the road, and then also, how are we talking to our neighbors? How are we engaging with local politics? Are we, sh are we representing our values in a multi-layered way? You know, some of, for some of us, that could be the most dignified and meaningful work that we do. And actually, it's in that vein that we really hope that our book can support people because it is those everyday conversations that we think make 
a lot of difference? How would you prepare for that one thing that really meant something if you weren't practicing it all the time? As to how do you bring yourself wholly to this and, and listen to the other when you don't agree? You know? Completely. And, you know, I, I think that that's a really beautiful dovetail, Kim. Uh, let's talk about the disagreements and, and what, especially again, so all of this work that you've done that has led you to co-authoring this book, um, being a, 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 an expert really on building peace and being a peacemaker and a, and a bridge builder in so many regards. Um, what would you say to someone who has someone in their life? Um, and obviously like we, this could be, this could pertain to strangers as well, but, but we're really talking about like when the risk feels higher, um, what do we do when we have someone who has zero interest in having a conversation around compassion or growth or self-discovery or considering their own blind spots who are just so caught up in the rhetoric and they just, um, their resistance is almost deafening. You know, what, like, what would your advice be to those of us that have had those encounters or continue to, or will in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whew. It's really challenging. <laughs> it's really challenging when we're across purposes in conversation. For me, in answering this question, my first instinct is to actually take a step back and ask what is the nature of the relationship, that connection point, and the potential for something to open up here. I don't go out and actively participate in every single opportunity for you know, a challenging conversation. Um, and for me, what's most important to look at is what is our intention? What am I coming with? What are they coming with? If we can actually explicate that and begin to um, pave some common understanding about what, what, you know, sort of page, what are we, what page are we standing on together here? That can be very helpful because if you don't, you might come with the desire to be compassionate with, des with the desire for genuine exchange, you know, and also to share your point of view. If the other person is coming because actually they really just need to get something off their chest, you know, those cross purposes could affect how you feel about how the conversation is going, your diet, your co inner commentary about what needs to be changed and where you're struggling with it because they're not hearing you, for example. Um, it might also be the case that, and so some of my, yeah, my co-authors and I and some of the, the world that, of work that we're in, we're involved in facilitating conversations with people who might have a hard time setting up that culture for themselves, how mm -hmm. to set up productive dialogues. And where we're creating containers, creating a shared culture and ground rules can actually become very important. We are allowed to have a say in how this process is being designed and that is happening sometimes when we're not aware of it based on assumptions about how these things should go. So I think if I imagine, you know, a listener who wants to engage someone, but that person is just not up for listening, doesn't want to have their perspective changed, I think that it would be interesting for them to ask themselves, why is there, what is their desire to engage with this person? If in there it's a desire to change their mind, that's going to be felt by the other person, even if we're saying perfect words out of our mouths. So mm. it's about us also getting curious about our consciousness that we're bringing to it. And then, you know, we, as I said, we don't have to, I, oh gosh, I remember once when I was in my twenties, I got a fight, got in a fight, a verbal fight with a cab driver in London about bicycles you know because i was a cyclist so of course i had a story about what's the right and wrong way to do things and when he's kind of swearing just casually as cabbies do sometimes you know he's just being him like this is his like daily kind of you know thing that he's doing and so i, I can just step back from it now and kind of laugh at myself and be like what exactly was my skin in the game there you know they're really you know mm. you don't have to engage every single conflict but when it aligns with our, both of our intentions and there's an opportunity to grow from the conflict then i'm down i'm in you know i do uh gosh can we i feel like we could do um like i feel like we could unpack this for a month this is so this is such important 
work. This is such an important conversation. Uh, compassion definitely belongs uh, in conversations around activism and around art. Uh, you and I were talking uh, earlier, Kim, and I shared with you that I'd watched the Ai Weiwei documentary, Never Sorry. And um, he makes this really beautiful statement that everything is political and everything is art. And, and I think if we are willing to consider whether or not that may or may not be a truth, um, you know, I think that it, I think it's a powerful commentary if we are, if we're willing to see it that way, that, that from writing a book to creating a podcast, to being an engineer, uh, to writing mathematical code. I mean, everything is art and everything is political. And, and I think that there is an opportunity for us as evolving self-actualizing human beings, if we choose to go there, um, is to start to at least initiate an opening to be willing to ask what side of history, right? Rather than looking at what side are we on politically or what side are we on racially, what if we just ask what side of history do we want to be on? And and I want to go a little deeper into that, but I, I want to take a minute to acknowledge the work that you do in the world and what you are creating and how you are contributing. And because I know that you work with individuals, I know that you work with groups, uh, you're going to be doing you know, a virtual book tour. Um, I would love it, Kim, if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, with our uh, attendees today and those who are viewing the recording, how can people get a hold of you? How can they get your book? Where can they find you? Um, if they wanna have a conversation with you, where are you in the world? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So best, best place would be my website, KimberlyLow.com. And we currently are offering a free call on, uh, I believe, July 31st and um, on for compassionate conversations with my co-authors. We're kind of calling it the essentials. And it's, it's a free call and then all registrants would get a discount for a workshop that we're doing on biases, power and shadow on July the 7th. Um, I'm very happy to connect on social media um, at the Kim Lowe on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. I think it's Kimberly Dash Low. Um, and I think it's wonderful to be part of this community. Sean Marie, we just met once in, in person and it's just astounding to me what it's like to be in the company of women whose hearts, minds, you know, hunger in the same way that I feel mine too. So yeah, I, I, I really welcome if anyone wants to reach out to me and learn more. I would love that. And Kim, I'm putting it in the chat. Uh, can you tell me again what the name of your workshop is on July 7th? Sure. Um, biases, Shadow, and Power. Biases, I'm sorry, what was the rest? I lost you for a second. Oh, Biases, Shadow, and Power. Fantastic. On uh, the, the July 7th and okay. uh, yeah, 31st is, is the free call. Um, and so from compassionateconversations.com, it's compassionateconversations.com slash free call, I believe, and compassionateconversations.com slash workshop. I don't have these things to hand to just pop in the chat. I apologize. But, um, I really welcome anyone to reach out if they have any questions. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank can you I just so hop much. If, there, if that was okay for that, can I hop back in with something that's kind of cooking in me from... Yes. And what your previous question was, Please. Um, and also where I think, where I think maybe you were setting up with just now in, in what you were saying, um, because some of the work that I do with women is actually coaching and consulting on negotiation. I think it's also very, very important that we learn how to ask for what we want and, and represent the changes in the world that would be representative of the legacy that we want to leave, as you said, to be on that side of history that, that really, you know, it's, you know, we feel it in us when something is aligned with our values in that way. 
I do think negotiation and communication more widely, you know, just then I, is, is very important for us to look at a, a bigger spectrum of what are we trying to achieve here really through this practice of relationship. Um, I believe that dialogue is the cornerstone for all significant social change. It needs, things need to be built on consensus, a shared understanding, a shared common vision of humanity. And conversation is absolutely paramount in getting us there. Um, so that was something that was just sort of sparking me perhaps as a, something from, from what we were talking about before. You know, I think you bring up a really powerful the, the book is Compassionate Conversations. And I think that you, just even in your statement, excuse me, uh, I think that you are really kind of bringing that to a finer point, which is com compassionate communication. Mm -hmm. And because I think that we can, we can have compassionate conversations and then turn around as we saw recently on the news for anybody watching, um, that, uh, oh my God, her name is escaping me. They, they call her by her initials, um, Cortez. Um, that she had a confrontation with um, a, a fellow uh, representative and they, you know, had this exchange and then he turned around and walked away and was muttering some things under his breath. And, um, and some said, hey, I heard him say, like, I don't have it on tape, but he said this. And so I think that having a compassionate conversation is one thing and having compassionate communication as a skill set um, is something else entirely. And I think it's something, AOC, thank you. Thank you, Kay. Yes, AOC. Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's something that we learn. And I think to be compassionate with ourselves, if we've not yet developed that, um, and, you know, again, going back to the biases and looking at our blind spots and just being like, gosh, like that's something that I, uh, that I want to really cultivate in myself or for those of us that, you know, fancy ourselves, you know, on the path to enlightenment and, uh, and doing this work, even being willing to look at where can I be better? Where can I do better? Mm -hmm. I really, I love you brought that up and it is about women asking for what they want and and I think too, kind of going back to one of the first things that we talked about um, is the power of compassion, that, that compassion, um, it can bring a tone of assertiveness, right? Like we can be in a compassionate conversation or be having compassionate communication and have it be fierce, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, I, and I think that that, and you and I haven't worked together in that regard, Kim, but I would imagine that that is probably something that you really support and advocate for, for, or with your clients, um, that this isn't a sweet, tender, you know, like, you know, big dimples and, oh gosh, I'm so compassionate that, that it's, um, that compassion is really the way of the warrior, mm -hmm. you know, and you and I were talking a little bit about, um, uh, just so important and uh, we are at 607 and there there's more that I would definitely love to unpack with you Kim and I'd also uh, just want to take a moment and ask our um, our attendees our beautiful guests if, if anybody has any questions uh, for Kim or for myself or if there's something that you might like to contribute to the conversation I would like to say something <laughs> please hi Kay Hi, hi everybody. Thank you, Kim. Um, so something that you said, um, as, I mean, I was thinking about it as you were talking because um, I've had conversations with other people who, who ask me, well, how am I supposed to feel? You know, am I supposed to feel guilty now for 400 years or am I supposed to feel guilty about what's going on? And I said, no, the only thing that I would, I would say would be, I would hope that you would understand that this isn't about, um, well, I hope that you would uh, will understand that when you make a statement, 
you're not making a statement for me because whatever you're saying doesn't apply to me, you know? And, and I said, you have to, you're not really thinking about the world when you make a statement, you're thinking about you, right? Um, and so I said, you have to realize, you know, I, I, I'm of a different race. I've had different experiences. So when you make a statement, it's offensive, you know, to people who haven't had the experience that you've had. And I'm not talking about money. I'm just talking about living in this world. And she quite, she didn't quite understand that. And that's when she, she said to me, should I, am I supposed to feel guilty? And I said, no, no, this isn't about you feeling guilty. It's about recognizing how there's a part of this world that didn't have the experience, didn't have the opportunities that were available to you that I might not have been able to take advantage of. And so when you make a statement about something, you're incorporating that you think everybody had this opportunity and they really did not. So as much as many conversations as I've had, I, I'm not 100% optimistic that um, people truly understand what this whole thing, this whole movement is about. I know they want to, but I don't, sometimes I feel like they're inhibited, that they just can't mm -hmm. because of their experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I hear you. And it can be tremendously frustrating to be in that position where the other person is just seems inherently limited from how, the, how far they can even imagine being outside of themselves to really express some, not just empathy, but just clear hearing. So they, yeah. they can hear you on the terms that you're seeking to be heard on. That can be yeah. hugely, hugely frustrating. And so I, it's no wonder that we do get run down and we do get sort of a feeling of discouragement. I absolutely you just want to make that completely kind of clear that that can happen. And for many of us who work, I believe, as mission-driven people, perhaps in institutions or organizations that might not be reflective of their fully catalytic potential, it can be very, very challenging if we're seeking changes that are so important and dear to us. One thing that I have learned that seems to be, <laughs> seems to be helping with me, but I got to admit, I'm, I'm right there with you some days, you know. Um, one thing that I've heard that helps me is that the arc, of the, the arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice with the addition that that may be beyond our lifetime. The kinds of, oh, it's yes. like we're trying to build cathedrals here. Mm. If I expect to see the change in four years or 10 years, or by the time that my children are 10, I'm going to get too discouraged. And so I think I see this now as a much more longer term endeavor that yes, we can give great credit to the freedom fighters and people who've stood up for our rights and our the evolution of fairness and freedom, even within our memories times, but actually we're standing on the shoulders of ancestors who come way before, way, way before. So for me, it's something to do with like taking a larger perspective, acknowledging the reality in what's happening in your environment. And so maybe choosing not to engage in conversations where people don't share the intention to actually understand and hear you. You know, maybe your energy would be better served by engaging in conversations where you do feel a little bit more of that potential opening um but yeah just that to me and i hope that helps just that like the wider perspective like oh we are all it's like we're we're little fish and we're swimming in that wider shoal and sometimes we can't see that bigger picture because we're still in it but actually i feel trust that our evolution is bringing us towards freedom and fairness oh, you know, I, 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 no. no i'm sorry go, go ahead. ahead go ahead kay no no i was gonna say i, I agree with that I, I don't think it'll have happen in my lifetime but, and I'm aware of that, but I just do what I can, my little part that I can do to educate when I can. Yeah, yeah. I loved what you said, Kim, about change is this long arc, you know, yeah. and, um, and I was, I've been reminded of that recently in that, um, you know, I, I watched um, the PBS um, show about the women's, women gaining the right to vote. It was a two-part series. 
And I knew all the pieces of it. I knew all those players, but somehow seeing it strung together in that series like that and realizing how long those women labored and saw nothing was, I mean, was incredibly humbling to me. And then when John Lewis passed away, it was another like kick in the gut of my God, this is just, it just takes so long and how much do we have to learn and how much do we have to experience? And um, it, I'm, I'm reading a book right now um, by Layla Syed that's called White Supremacy and Me. I'll tell you, if you want, if you want to just get kicked in the gut, it's like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I got this thing down. I think I, you know, I, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Oh yeah, you have a big problem with that, you know? And, and the way the book is structured is it's, um, it's like every chapter deals with a particular bias or a particular perspective. And she leads you through a way of challenging what you think and, um, I mean, it is really, if anyone truly is interested in knowing where is this inside of me, it's a great book to read because until, you know, until as a society, we're willing to say, um, not am I supposed to feel guilty, but where is my guilt in this? You know, that's, that's where we have to be as a society of, um, of being willing to open that up and look at that and see that. And, you know, whether it's, it's long-term political change, like in, in the woman's right to vote, uh, voter rights, you know, that are still freaking not, not voted on, uh, the, the ERA that has still not been ratified, you know, where, where do we stand on that? Where do we, how do we remain engaged and where do we see our culpability, I guess, in, in all of that? Yeah, we're still fighting. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And Kay, and I just want sure. to, I'd like to take a minute too and just acknowledge that one of the things that I experienced um, with, and I, I'm assuming that this was a white woman that was having this conversation with you, Kay. Yes. So, one of the things that I experienced, especially after uh, the murder of George Floyd and all of the subsequent stories um, and uh, atrocities that came to the surface as a result of that, um, many of which had already been in the news and had since gone by the wayside um, because uh, of the, you know, it, those stories didn't have longevity. They, they weren't given the value and the attention that they so deserved. Um, but one of the things that I experienced personally was I, I took a step back and I hadn't been very active on social media anyway, but I had people reaching out to me um, who I know through social media and some friends and people saying like, gosh, you're so quiet. Are you okay? Like, the, like you, you're usually so active and you always have you know such inspiring things to say and and on one hand like I had people looking to me saying what are you saying and what are you thinking and I there were moments Kay where I wanted to say something but I really felt that in my gut in that my place was to be quiet that my place was to do my work and do my homework and reach out to black women that I know, and I would have reached out to black men as well if I, um, but that's not where my, like my heart was like, talk to your friends, ask these questions, have these conversations, deepen your own understanding, go back to history. Um, where, like, like I said to, to Kimberly, like, where am I on this side of history? Because I know how I feel and I know what I'm saying, but I thought, you know, have I really taken the time to do my homework? And what I was experiencing was a lot of women who I know because they're well known, uh, a lot of women who I know because I know them, but a lot of white women that I felt were unfortunately moving into a place that I um, and it caused me anxiety 
because again, like I was like, do I feel compassion for them? Good for them for speaking up and saying something, but it also didn't feel like it, the timing of it felt opportunistic. You know, these weren't conversations that they've been having for the last 10 years. Right. And I, like, I thought, you know what, if I say anything right now, it's probably going to be to that. Like I, like my, <laughs> yeah, yes, up the floodgates. <laughs> yes. So this, this rage that I was feeling for the injustices that were happening were being also mirrored by the outrage and disappointment and confusion that I was having around so many white women suddenly feeling like that this was their mantle. And I know that there was, you know, this movement around like past the mic. That's how I was feeling. I felt like, you know what, this is, um, this is my time to be a witness. This is my time to hold the space and to be a guard and to be a warrior for this movement that is happening for these voices that need to be heard. And so I agree completely with what, what Kim was saying is that I've also had to like really embrace that not everybody is ready for these conversations. And Kay, one of the things that I've experienced with you, and I know that I don't know you that well, but you are uh, incredibly graceful and gracious. And I would imagine that when you are entering into these conversations that you are probably giving these women a, a pretty wide berth. And I think that your professionalism and your ability to be diplomatic um, might actually be like, you know, keeping you from saying things that maybe you would, you would want to say, or, or maybe that you would say to us, right? Like where you're like, can we just get can we real for a can second? <laughs> but I will tell you, um, I, I, yes, can we talk? Exactly. Yes. Uh, and I, and I've had friends say that to me. I've had family say that to me, like, how is this my responsibility? And I'm like, because it is your responsibility. It is our responsibility. Our history shows that it is our responsibility. Um, you know, did, did, were you a slave owner? No. Did you, you know, were you committing crimes against people of color? No, but we have a responsibility to take ownership for changing the course of history, for being an advocate for those that who have been voiceless for centuries. Right. And so I, I, I just, I wanted to take a minute, Kay, and just like take a minute to acknowledge you and your willingness to have these conversations. And I think that if we can find within ourselves ability to hold that space of compassion, but also like, let's get to the yes or the no more quickly. Like I, somebody who has experienced you, I, I would prefer to not see you taking your time um, your precious time because our time is very precious and continuing to give it to people that just can't see it. And I'm wondering if there isn't a way that you might be able to engage by asking questions that are designed to draw them out, designed to help get questions answered that would actually support them and help move the conversation in a direction of where you would really like to see it go. Because Kay, the thing that I really believe to be true about you is I think you're a phenomenal teacher. And I think that you are a powerful voice in this movement. And, and I think that there is a way in this whole different conversation, but I think that there is a way where you can have effective, compassionate, fierce conversations with people that that leave you feeling less drained and less frustrated and like, you know, walking away, like she's never going to get it. Yeah. Um, because I, I have felt the same way. And like I said, I have family that I've just, I've had to really honor my boundaries. Um, but again, to what Kim was saying, like really like being more mindful for ourselves. Like if I'm going to enter into this conversation, what is my intention? Is my intention to give this person five minutes of a really heartfelt conversation? Is my intention to like really go there? Um, but I just, I want you to feel supported in that because this is not the first time that I've heard you say this. And I just want you to feel seen and heard and supported and just say like collectively, um, we've got your back. Yeah, and I just, I want, 
I, I'm craving that for you, for this, I don't know, it, it feels, uh, whew, it, it feels fierce. Like I want that fierceness in you to, um, to be honored. Um, and, uh, and for people to, to receive the benefit of being in conversation with you. That's what I want to say. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, this happened to be a very good friend of mine that I worked with for 30 years. Um, and we've never had that conversation. So, um, wow. So, so, you know, actually I was appreciative of the fact that she actually brought it up. Um, so, but I have had so many conversations with, with others, um, you know, since this all started and you're right, it is draining and it's especially draining when you're trying to explain something and somebody says to you, well, you know, just, just get over that. That was, you know, that was thin. This is now, you know, and I, I mean, I just don't even want to go there because I could be the kind of person, you know, that can shut somebody down like really fast, but you know, I choose not to do that. I choose to engage in the conversation, you know, and, and try to make them understand. And hopefully I can walk away not feeling drained, feeling like I accomplished something or they understand something. That's if they understand, if I can explain to them, this is what happened to me. So I'm no different. This is, but this is what happened. This is why I am who I am. And if you can understand that and you can understand why those things happened to me, that's really all I want you to understand. So when you, when you think about something, you can relate that, put that in your mind, you know, cause it doesn't, what you're saying doesn't apply to everybody. It applies to you because you're white. Absolutely. You know? and, and finally, I, I, that, that's just the way I laid it out. Okay. Remember you are white, you have privilege. And she said, no, I do not. I said, yes, but it's not about your money. hundred percent. It's about your color. Okay. So, so then I started just like, I'm getting loud. You know, I, then I said, okay, you know what? Let's just leave it like this. <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's, it's draining, but you know what? Some conversations are, are better than others, you know? And Can I say something, Kay? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Donna. Hi, how are you? I'm good. So, to me, it's, it's about awareness. So if so, when she said, I loved it when you said, how am I supposed to feel? Yeah. What the response in my mind is because I'm more like you, I'm, I'm direct. And, um, it, it's about, I'm trying to create awareness because these conversations, I think we need to have them and different levels with an understanding what people say speaks more to who they are yeah. than, yeah. than you. So, if, if in the middle of these conversations, we can begin to go to an arena of learned respect. And I think that's so it's all it, baby steps. But I think by not talking to people who think differently, we're doing everybody a disservice. disservice. And we're so into that right now. Yeah. And it's not about, it's, it's about knowing what your intent is and your intent is just to open that window of awareness every time you have a conversation and right, that might right. take some of that pressure off of you because change comes in baby steps but if we're not all acting and interrelating with polar opposites then we're i think we're in serious trouble i think that's we're way too much into that right now. You know, I, I, I think that that's a really great point, Donna. And the only thing that I want to say to that is in regards to um, personal and emotional well being. And I think that Kim could probably really speak to this since uh, she's been doing this work for years. And, and I think that there is, I think, and I think there is an opening that is initiated when somebody starts asking these questions. But I think what is monumentally important is that the intent is established up front because uh, I am absolutely willing to have a conversation, which I have in my own family, with people who I have polar opposite views from. Uh, but if somebody, if I, if I feel in my gut, if my instincts are telling me that this person really wants to engage to be in a fight or be argumentative, I'm not interested. But if somebody wants to have a real 
heart-centered, let's meet each other in the middle kind of conversation. Um, I think that those are worthy conversations, but going back to one of the questions that I asked Kim is when do we do the work and when do we retreat? Like when do we need to take a moment and recuperate and when are we really in it? And I think I, I, I do, I personally, this is just my humble opinion. I do not think every fight is our fight. And I, and I don't mean that like literally I'm using fight figuratively, but um, I am not interested in engaging in every single person or with every single person that has an opinion that is different than mine. If their intention is solely to be right. And, and I was, I was just really making that comment with Cade because I, I know I know what a professional she is, and and Kay, I know again how uh, how open you are, and I just I think it is also equally important for us to have some boundaries. And I hope everybody will forgive my language, but there is a quote that I love and I live by, and it is "wide open heart, big fucking fence." And so I. I love that and it resonated with me because I do lead with my heart and I work from my heart and I speak from my heart, but I've had to also learn that I need to be very discerning about who I actually let in um, because for those of us that are change makers and are sensitive and believe in righteous causes, I think it is important that we also establish boundaries so that we can take care of ourselves and uh, and be aware of who we, which we get to choose, right? We get to choose who we will and will not engage in conversations with. And I don't think that that means that we only have conversations with people who share opinions. I just think that we have the right and we owe it to ourselves to be discerning about who we are engaging in those conversations with and establishing that our intention is truly attuned and aligned. Thank you for that. Thank you, Kay. Um, well, ladies, it is 6.31 p.m. and I wanna be mindful and honor our time. Um, I can certainly stay on for a few more minutes, but Kim, I would, I would be so delighted if you would like to share any closing remarks with us and uh, and also just say if anybody has any burning questions or a desire to share something um, I want to invite you forward as well I don't have anything before I... I I actually have a question for you Kim the title compassionate conversations I like where did you come up with that um, my idea is that Compassion requires a lot of courage because it's a lot easier to just whatever. I'm not going there. I don't care. I'm not going to do it. But to be compassionate requires a, a certain level of vulnerability and a willingness to be open and say, maybe I'm wrong um, to extend compassion to somebody else. So I'm curious, where did you, what's the impetus of the, the term compassionate conversation? Yeah, great question. Um, initially, we actually titled the book Evolving Conversations, and we were really emphasizing how we grow developmentally in our ability to take different perspectives, to hold conflict, hold complexity, and really emphasizing how, you know, we have natural world evolving, then we have our cultural and our inner worlds evolving alongside that. We were just, you know, massaging the relational, conversational aspect of it. I think we switched to compassion a, because Shambhala weren't so down with like the emphasis on the evolution, I guess, at this moment. Um, but also because I think for me, and this is maybe just like letting in you a bit more into how I think I'm relating to the world nowadays. It's like, I think I take it for a given that we're in imperfect times. There are reasons to be afraid. There are reasons to be stressed. There are tremendous reasons to be hopeful too, but just, for me, I don't know, I, maybe I studied philosophy when I was too young. I just get a little existential about what is this all for? Who am I? Where am I going? And who with? And when I really sink into maybe the truth of all of this imperfection, what it calls forth in me 
his compassion is a natural response to that. It means I'm imperfect. It means you're imperfect. It means that we're going to make, make mistakes together as we go down having these awkward and difficult conversations where people get triggered and there are serious reasons to demand for justice on its own terms for the benefit of all peoples. You know, we have a lot of competing priorities and yet I believe that if we don't take the perspective like there's something fundamentally you know, wrong here and like just the reaction to it, which is to recoil back and maybe some of that shrinking away, but it's also dependent on who we are and where we tend to pattern that that doesn't, you know, it's not the same message for every different person. Um, but when I just take into account, like we're all growing in this together and also the, the chap, the final chapter in our book is in it together, as in we need each other, as in no one is going to be, we can't find that solution if we're leaving people out. Everything needs to be inclusion. It's why we have such a push in our common collective now on inclusion, actually bringing in marginalized voices, giving them a place at the table, allowing these narratives, which for so long have been silenced, allowing that to come forth. And of course, there's gonna be resistance and people who you know, have reasons, whether it's for you know, fragility or just lack of exposure or anything else like that. So we gotta learn how to grow into this space together and there's work to be done on both sides in multiple domains. And it doesn't mean we've got to do it all at once. This is not something that's going to be right and wrong, but rather who we are as we grow year on year, day on day. Thank you, Kay. I love that you agree with that. We definitely need each other. And I, you know, we were, I was recently doing a workshop on shadow and Diane, my co-author, made the point that this is not a finite event. This is not just now that we have this intensity in our political climate in 2021, we're going to be back on climate change. No, no, this is sustained ongoing work and hence our mention of resilience in the title of this to encourage us to find the parts of ourselves that actually are very enduring, that it's, it's not easy, but in a way we know how to do this. You know, I'm inspired by Joan of Arc when she says, I'm not afraid, I was born to do this. And I really like to believe that we are born for these times. You know, I can't imagine a previous generation being plonked into the now. We are the ones that are made for the now. Um, so thank you, Patty. You got me off on one there. And compassion. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for showing up and sharing your time, your faces, your hearts. Thank you, Sean Marie and Patty, for having me. It's been wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kim. And Kim, I just wanted to ask you, when you said we are trying to build cathedrals. Who was that quote from? Oof. Do you know? I actually don't know off the top of my head, but if it helps, some of the storyline that I remember is like three humans making bricks out of the, the dust and the clay. The first one is approached, what are you doing that for? And he's saying, I'm, I'm, making, I'm making bricks. That's what I'm doing. I'm making bricks, literal bricks. The next one's like, oh, I'm creating a, a, a structure. I'm, I'm going to create a structure with it. And the third one is, is like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm building a cathedral. You know, and I, that's all I got, I'm afraid. Mm. But I'm sure you could Google that and you'll come up with yeah, the yeah. answer. <laughs> it's, so, it's so beautiful, Kim. And um, we are, in fact, building cathedrals. And uh, Kim, if you could give us the Reader's Digest version of this last question that I, I do want to ask you, because I think that Donna brought up a really, really important point, um, as did Kay. And if we find ourselves um, confronted with someone and we are wanting to engage and we, you know, and Kay, you even used the language you said, you know, I, I want to, and forgive me, I'd have to listen back to the recording to, I should have written it down, but I think you said, I want to make them understand. I want to educate um, them, yes. Right, and so I think if we can find ourselves in a space of, because I, I, I'm with you, Kay, like I, I want people to get this, but I also know that not, not everyone is my, um, I'm not meant to save all of them. I'm not meant to educate all of them, but I, but I do think that there are ways that we can shorten those conversations that start to feel a little tumultuous, Kim, and um, if there is a way or references that we can give to people that might actually act as an invitation to come back to the conversation at a later date. So not to shut them down or not to um, dismiss them or be dismissive or take that attitude, but if there are things that we could suggest and say, you know, um, just what resources you might recommend for somebody who is 
wanting to learn more, but maybe just isn't quite at that point yet. Resources on how to engage people who are not coming on the same terms. I just want to check. I understand, right? Right. Essentially, like where, where would, where would, where could somebody start if they, like, where's a good starting point for somebody who might want to learn more about compassion or check their own biases. And, and I know that we've, we've mentioned some of the books, you know, any work by James Baldwin, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, Layla Saeed's book. I mean, there's a lot of really great material out there, the work that you're doing. But I'm just wondering if you have a starting point, if somebody finds themselves at that intersection with somebody who is proving to be difficult, but who you are hopeful for, who you, who you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I understand. Um, so I will certainly have a think if any sort of easy resources come to mind that maybe could be shared with an email if there is one. I think at the moment I'm not quite, I'm, so I used to do a lot of mediation and peace building research in the United Nations system in the international context. And there are certain thought, well, leaders in the field, um, the work seems to be, be more, um, I mean, I find the concepts beautiful. I know that some of the listeners here might want something shorter. I would say to actually look up myself and my co-authors, if it's this kind of conversation that you're interested in having. We do facilitation work. There's videos, there's recordings of webinars and podcasts, especially recently what with, um, what with our book launch. Um, there's a shadow workshop that's available on the Coaches Rising uh, website right now. I think, that, to be honest, I'm having a hard time because I just see this work that's is so that's, layered. That's it's okay. Depend on the individual as to what kind of impasse they're coming up against. You know, it's not really a one size fits all approach. If anything, I would inspire people to seek to embody the the identity of being a peace builder. When you said you have hope for them, it means there's a reason to engage for you that's worthwhile. So, I would sort of encourage that person to um thank you patty <laughs> i would encourage that person to like ask themselves like who do i need to be in order to really be of service to this conversation am i bumping up am i getting triggered frequently is there healing work that i need to do is it something to do with my language am i not somehow conveying the educational message which i seek to convey is there a difference between my intention and my impact get curious about why that's happening it could be that there are many other things that are conditioning that impact which are outside your your control in which case we don't want to pursue that avenue for too long from conflict um from a conflict mapping perspective, and just to zoom out and do a theory of social change here for a quick second as to what, what I think the motivation is for in having these kinds of conversations, I think that it would be really interesting to look at what we're trying to change and why and how we see those pieces coming together. It may be that changing the, the mindset of that one person, it feels like all your chips are on the table, but actually there could be av other avenues through which you engage dialogue with other people which are going to have a higher leverage from that specific little screw point if you know what I mean. So, so yes, affirming our own inner discernment that will guide us to know whether this is something worth persisting in. If we see a grain of humanity in the other person that is responsive to us, if we are not feeling that response and they're not willing to go there with us, and we should ask expressly, we should set up the conversation so that they know our intention. Hey, I'd love to have an, you know, don't let those things go assumed. Absolutely. The more that we can explicate that, invite them into it. Hey, is this some, something that you are interested in doing with me? It may be uncomfortable. We may have to look at our blind spots, but hey, we can see each other from perspectives that we can't inhabit fully ourselves. And so are you willing to go on this journey with me to be humbled by, you know, be humbled by this and connect more in the process? Because when you differentiate and then you come back together and affirm relationship, that strengthens and that teaches us that we can go deeper in the future. Um, so that oh. wasn't quite the answer I think you asked for, but there was something that must have wanted to come oh, out. Oh, no. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm no, going gonna, was... gonna to have to go, guys. But I just wanted to say to Chrissy, because I know I probably talked a lot. I'm sorry I took, if I took your time. I saw you making, making your, shaking your head. <laughs> Kay, you're, fine. you're fine. I really enjoyed listening to the conversation. Oh, okay. Kay, and Kay, I just want to say your contribution was, uh, was really important, and I'm so grateful that you were here tonight. So um, this all happened and unfolded 
really beautifully and just the way that it was meant to. So thank you, Kay. Oh, absolutely. Thank Everybody you. have a great evening. Thank you for the great conversation. It was uh, very enlightening and I enjoyed it. Always thank you, do. So, thank you, Kay. And we'll see okay. you again. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Kim. Bye, Bye Kay. All right, everyone. Well, Kim, uh, and again, there there was no right answer. I wasn't looking for a specific answer. I was just looking for a great place to start. And I think that um, you really summarized it so beautifully, which is to which is what I was attempting to say to Donna and to Kay, which is to begin with the intention and to speak the truth, right? Mm -hmm. And if we were to start with a bold statement like, "Do you want to go there?" Do you want to engage in this conversation with me? Do you have an hour? Okay. Um, are you right? If, if we bring it into the present, but I think so often, especially as women, which goes back to the beautiful thing you were saying, uh, Kim, about um, you know, asking for what it is that we want. So I think that as, as women specifically, as those of us that are more female oriented um, in our communication style, if we could say what we mean, and hold that space and engage in asking the question that we really want the answer to, um, that that might actually support us and help us in then having an effective conversation because we've made that agreement up front. And mm -hmm. I think that the, that the frustration that I was experiencing Kay talking about, which I know has happened for her a lot, um, I just was having this visceral response to her not, um, having the dialogue that I felt that she was really wanting to have. So you answered the question as I knew you would absolutely beautifully, Kim. And, um, and I'm just so grateful that you were here for this, for this day and this conversation and this really um, powerful uh, initiation of an opening. You know, I, I think that every time we have these conversations, the opening gets a little bit greater and we expand a little bit more. So um, thank you so, so much, Kim. And I wish you every success on your book, compassionateconversations.com, KimberlyLow.com. Uh, I encourage everybody to check her out. Um, definitely take advantage of the free workshop, which is uh, compassionateconversations.com slash free workshop. Is that it, Kim? Yeah, free call. Free call. Okay. And that, that is in the, uh, let's see here, compassionateconversations.com slash free call. So I'll put that down here again. Um, so yeah, I, I wish everybody well and uh, continued health. And I hope that you continue to take impeccable care of yourselves and your families and your loved ones and your hearts. And um, that we stay open to recognizing where we can be better and do better and continue to be compassionate with each other and with ourselves. So uh, as I always do, I'm gonna close this out with this beautiful quote that I love by one of my favorite writers, Tony Hoagland, and it is this. Some people think the truth is the worst thing that can happen. The truth is not the worst thing that can happen. So on that note, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kim. You were a wonderful guest. Thank you, ladies, for tuning in and for everybody listening. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you.